And I was wondering, do you think these bugs are more bugs are being attracted into the area because the soil is being depleted of trace minerals? A lot of pathogenic fungi, you know, they develop these these uh, adaptations in an environment where people aren't like taking the leaves and like composting them, right? For example, if you have all this competition and the soil is poor in one way or another, or there's these other competing factors and that ultimately results in a plant that is already s stressed in various ways. There's so much background infrared radiation already that it would make it very difficult to sort of take it, sort of see it. There'd be a lot of what we basically visual noise or perhaps vibrational yeah, interference. Noise. Why are bugs attracted to plants? Let's go ahead and get Matthew Gates' perspective on this. You're here with Mark Batwell and the rest of the team on Perfect Gardens TV. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Make sure to check us out on Instagram and Facebook. Our $2.97 membership is available on the join button below. And if you need a little more one-on-one, -on -one, our VIP link is down below in every video description. Make sure to hit the join button on the bottom of every video. You mentioned something earlier, actually, about... Uh, you, you've heard of Elaine Ingram, right? I do know Elaine Ingram. Uh, Elaine Ingham. So I've heard her say this, um, and you said this too, right? And I've heard this over the years where bugs are getting worse. They're getting, uh, not. I want, I want to stay away from their strength, but they're getting worse and they're getting more frequent. And you've probably, you've heard the same thing, right? I, I've heard that from a lot of people. And I was wanting to hear your thought process around, uh, Elaine, I've heard her say that bugs get tra attracted into the area because the soil is deplete of uh, minerals. And I was wondering, do you think these bugs are, more bugs are being attracted into the area because the soil is being depleted of trace minerals? I, I could see where that could have an effect, but I don't know if that's the proximate reason. Like for example, if a plant is- um, Because the bugs would replace the minerals. That's my thought process. When they die, whatever they eat, they're re they, my thought is that they're leaving behind the trace mineral that the soil is also needs or whatever the bacteria or the whatever that's missing. That was my thought process. Like kind of like, um, like they would feed on the plant and then die and then their body. Like would how a microbe would when they die. Exactly. Right. And it would re yeah. Restore the soil in a sense that it would keep attracting enough stuff until it was no longer interesting to them. But by that time, it's because they're like arthropods or their skin or their poop, all that stuff is regenerating things. Is Have you guys talked about any of that? Because I hear you guys say these things, but I don't know if that's what you're saying or if that's what I'm hearing. You know, and on top of that, I have found that when I, especially when you're dealing with somebody who has a reputation or any, or, or any sort of credibility or, or fame, or presence, I should say, maybe more neutrally. Basically, what I'm trying to say is if somebody has hurt, like there are people who attribute what other people say and then they'll like extrapolate. And I, I'm certainly guilty of it myself. But sometimes I've heard people say something and then I go to talk to the person who had said it and they'll cite that person. And then that person says, no, I didn't say that. Or that's not quite what I meant. So sometimes we even misinterpret that too. But like, for example, I what you're describing makes sense, right? So if you have an input of this organism that's made up of all these elements, right? And they'll like feed on the plant or whatever, like in aggregate, it's kind of like the water cycle, right? Like the water, you have it in the lake and then the water dehydrates. And then, you know, that you have this like cycling of the, the water. And of course this all happens in another way, but I mean, to this, so that statement is kind of vague, right? Like does the mineral or does the lack of like elements attract the insects well the things that attract insects or like herbivorous insects are what they see like because like to answer that question i would maybe I I'm biased. Glow. well like for their um like how does it like for example I have a video on my channel how do how do insects find their healthy how healthy, healthy plants and eat them like what what are they doing so there's like it's, it's an abstraction to say to go from like insects come somewhere because mineral depletion right? I'm sure there's a lot more to it than that, right? But, but so what they would do is they would use their eyes to see uh, a plant, right? They have, to, they have to have vision. So there's visual cues, olfactory, so there's scent, 
their ability to pick sense, sense up gustatory cues, especially with things like aphids, right? So they use all of these cues to find suitable hosts. Um, they kind of check for a bad immune system, right? Well, it's kind of, to an extent, right? So like, for example, and this is where I was going to go with this, I would definitely agree with the statement that if it was worded slightly differently, like, for example, so like if you have some sort of a dysfunction because certain elements aren't there, or especially in, a, in an ecological context where I think people have this bias that like sort of a fairy tale interpretation of forests, that they're all like all these creatures living in harmony, everyone's cool, there's no problems. When in fact, it's actually a massive death match between plants trying to outshade each other. That's why in, in experiments, you ask, do people look at this sort of stuff? Absolutely, they do. And there's there's interesting ecological theory about like sort of um, what, we, what we've what we termed um, shade avoidance syndrome in plants. So there's some they're, very... They're, uh, they're constantly kind of like fighting, not fighting, but they're competing with the their root system and their microbase with the other ones, correct? To try to gain that stop that dominance. Exactly. And I mean for some plants this matters more than others. Some are more adapted to, and of course, and we're talking a lot of times we're talking in the agricultural context, which is very far removed from the natural selection pressures. Not totally, but but very, you know, you know what I mean? So like we're making a bunch of abstractions about and that's why I like to couch things in ecological sense so that you can contrast because you can see, well, this happens in nature and it may also happen in an agricultural setting. And certain aspects of that behavior or symbiosis might be more intense because of agriculture uh, or, or how you're growing your plants, I should say. And some of them might be re more reduced because of the things that you're doing, like hygiene and sanitation, like a lot of pathogenic fungi you know, they develop these these uh, adaptations in an environment where people aren't like taking the leaves and like composting them, right? For example, so like like providing them a dirty apartment, yeah, yeah. So like the inocula that would be in the dried and desiccated and destroyed leaves, some of them might even be processed by like you know micro arthropods in the soil and that kind of a thing. But like by and large, they probably did a lot better in those environments. But but in an agricultural setting, we might disrupt that just as a natural aspect of how you grow and cultivate. Sometimes that's not intentional. Sometimes people know that that's a problem and they're intending to have that effect. You know what I mean? So, so it, basically coming back to your question, if you have all this competition and the soil is poor in one way or another, or there's these other competing factors and that ultimately results in a plant that is already stressed in various ways, and maybe there's also other factors too to consider like genetically or whatever. But yeah, uh, if, you're, if you're getting some chlorosis because like another fungus is attacking the plant and shutting off some xylem channels and all these other things. Yeah, like, the, like there's a reason why we have yellow sticky cards because they pick up on the yellow and that yellow is chlorosis. But that's like, a, um, but you have to look at the cause and effect, right? The cause is over millions of years, it's been adaptable. <laughs> it's been more adaptive for, for an herbivorous insect, a lot of them, to hone in on the yellow color because they tend to do better on it. Yeah. But they also care about the green because that's what tells them it's a plant too. So you, you brought up something really interesting right there. And again, I don't have a proper education. So it's like, I could say whatever I want and just walk away. You guys, it's on the line <laughs> with for you guys. It's a joke when I say that, but uh, no, you're right though. But you are right. <laughs> yeah. It's a good point. Yeah, it's true. Okay, um, but so I'm just gonna say something again. Might sound really stupid. Please put it into good jargon for us, if it makes sense. But sure. So the yellow, and I, I was thinking about it earlier. How birds find their way, right? They have like this internal compass in their mind. They have like a, a natural type. A magnet, right, exactly. Do bugs have something similar to where it, instead of them, like, I guess what they see through their eyes, like, do they are, do they see the plant or do they see a, a frequency or here. vibration, right? Because if the light, if the sun is coming down and hitting the solar panels and it's creating a prism in a sense of a frequency through those leaves, and those and the leaves and the plant store minerals all throughout the plant, whether they're mobile or immobile. And if they're 
if the minerals are depleted and the sun is coming down in a sense, creating a, a frequency or, or I've heard in multiple, a, a prism or whatever, is the bug actually being attracted to the plant possibly through kind of like an infrared sight, you know, like I want to call it infrared, but it's seeing it, it's seeing it through colors and it's, it's able to detect through, oh, you know, it's like a, if you if you have a heat gun, right, and everything's cold and there's a red, it's something's red in the center. Do bugs look at it like that, like where it's just like seen and it's like, oh, you know, that's that's heat. Like a sense. Yeah, exactly. Do they? Do you know? Does that make any sense at all? What I'm saying, or uh, it's not quite as as I understand it. It's not quite like what you say. It does actually sound a lot like a. Um, uh, something called the um, uh, vibrational theory of olfaction, but that would be olfaction, not vision. But it's this idea, which is not supported, I guess, by the literature. This has actually been a very, this has been something postulated for like more than a hundred years, maybe more than 200 years about uh, insect vision and or olfaction, which is the idea that like, that like molecules that are vibrating to give off IR, right? IR, this background, there's IR radiation. And mm -hmm. so the insects use either their antennae or perhaps their eyes. Uh, there are other, there are versions of this that have evolved over this time period. And they um, basically that they're able to detect these wavelengths through the vibrating. And so that, and so people who say that maybe it's olfaction, that there's olfactory receptors in their antennae and that those antennae are basically picking up these IR frequencies. But I guess apparently, according to, and I've read the literature in like the 1960s and 70s, uh, a gentleman named Philip Callahan was very prominent in, 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 in saying that he very much thought that this was the case. As far as I can tell, he didn't actually do any experiments that would confirm this. And I guess other physicists also thought that there wasn't really a basis for it. And one of the major issues, I, I, as I understand it, I remember, I didn't make a video on this or anything, but maybe I should, because it's kind of a fascinating idea. But I guess... There's so much background infrared radiation already that it would make it very difficult to sort of take it, sort of see it. There'd be a lot of what we basically visual noise or perhaps vibrational yeah, interference. Noise. Yeah, I exactly. Guess like I guess what Mark's trying to also say is like, do they know a plant is like there's something wrong with it before they can actually get to it? So that way so it's like kind of wasting less energy and time on their part too. So if they have like a, a proxy, I don't know, like, like yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Like some, yeah. something to be able to tell, no. like low bricks, even like where they are able to host that plant now. And through like maybe time, they could have created some sort of sensory factor, like you're talking about, uh, old sensory factor or something, where they're able to get that cue off of that plant without having. So, you know. so, so going forward, yeah. So basically, insect vision is super variable depending on the the order and species and things, and so we understand sort of a fraction about that and we have certain model organisms, but basically a few hard and fast rules is that uh, insect vision and arthropod vision in general is very, very poor resolution. And a lot of insects do not see the range of colors that we do. And they also oftentimes, as we understand how their eyes work, it seems to be the case that shades can sometimes not even be like, we can, they can't even necessarily tell. They're also uh, slow motion. This. What? Aren't they also kind of slow motion? Like their their speed is almost different, like in their lane and oh. their, their lenses. Yeah, I mean, it I think that also really depends on the insect. So, like like you know, uh, stereotypically, a fly or a cockroach can uh, react very very deftly, whereas like aphids are kind of lumbering, not super reactive. Uh, the leaf hoppers we talked about earlier are incredibly vagile and swift, and they can and they'll just like they'll evacuate before you even get close to them. Yeah, not um, like so, a fungus gnat where they're like clumsy. Yeah, like like a, a hummingbird. A hum no way a hummingbird interprets life the way we interpret it when it can flap mm -hmm. its wings and go as fast as it goes in any and and in any direction. Right. And like um, but like so they also have their they have their compound eyes that do a lot of that sort of visual um so a lot a lot of insects see green, yellow, or um red or a um and usually in ultraviolet, there's usually cones for like three colors, but like, it's so hard to, you can't equivocate it with human vision, human and mammalian vision generally is so much fundamentally different that 
it almost becomes very difficult to say talk to simplify it without becoming like without saying the wrong thing uh but they also have becoming the bug itself yeah yeah well, <laughs> well like a lot of insects also can see polarized light which we don't i don't think we have or if we do we see it in a very limited way what is polarized light so that's light where basically there's a uh, rotation to i think if i understand if i remember correctly um the particles so what happens is that it sort of and we don't, I don't, again, we don't really see polarized light. So I can only describe it in like a theoretical sense. But um, a lot of times polarized light comes from the sun or from reflections. So like when the, when the light bounces off of a surface, it yeah. can change the polarity. And so an insect would use that information. That could be very useful if you're, I don't know, flying. For, you or at nighttime to, too, right? Or at nighttime. Mm-hmm. Or if you're trying to find which way was up. Yeah. That's yeah, very interesting. Is. Back in the day and the earlier, they would layer newsprints and cardboard and things of that nature in their tomato gardens. And the idea behind it was it would prevent weeds from coming up, but also the uh, paper uh, retained the water better. What grower grade was able to do was become a full fledged media that held its own, had airspace and porosity where roots really enjoyed growing throughout it. 